Hello, and thank you for joining this AJMC Peer Exchange titled, A Closer Look at Rare Diseases, Spinal Muscular Atrophy and Huntington's Disease. With 250 rare diseases newly identified every year, scientists can barely keep up. Today, we're going to address two rare diseases, spinal muscular atrophy and Huntington's disease, and we're going to learn about some exciting treatment options. Together with our expert panel, we're going to discuss the burden of disease and get a better understanding of the disease overall. We're also going to learn about new treatment options that will change the lives of patients living with these diseases. I'm Dr. Peter Salgo. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and I'm associate director of surgical intensive care at the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. Participating today on our distinguished panel, Dr. John Bransma, neuromuscular section head at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and assistant professor of clinical neurology at Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Shika Dunyo, Director of Education Programs of National Organization for Rare Disorders in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Maria Lopes, Medical Director at AMC Health in New York, New York. So nice they named it twice, huh? Thank you all for joining us. Let's start off. We're going to start with Huntington's disease. It's a disease I think a lot of people know the name of, as opposed to some of the other, I guess we'll call them rare diseases. Um, and they know so because there have been some prominent people who've had this disease. So why don't we start with a simple definition? It's not enough to know the name. What is Huntington's disease? Well, Huntington's disease is an inherited condition. It's a neurodegenerative disorder. So we tend to see patients presenting in uh, young adulthood with the disorder, in their 30s or 40s with first symptoms. Although there are rare pediatric cases as well. I'm a child neurologist, so in a very rare circumstance, we may meet uh, people in childhood with this disorder, but most of the time it presents in adulthood. And the usual symptoms are both psychiatric and neurological, so you'll end up having mood changes and dysfunction of cognition, uh, but also uh, involuntary movements and uh, hyperkinesis. I'm, I'm curious, why, why would there be this widespread of onset? In other words, I was always taught, when I was taught at all, because nobody talks much about it, at least not when I was in medical school, that it comes on in your 30s and 40s. What genetic predisposition would have it come on in childhood? So there's something that can sometimes happen in this group of disorders. It's called a trinucleotide repeat disorder. And so what that means is that, that sounds bad. Yeah, an way. area <laughs> of a gene called Huntington, uh, where there's a certain number of repeats of the same uh, trinucleotide sequence. And sometimes when that's inherited, the trinucleotide sequence expands. And so you have this phenomenon called anticipation, mm -hmm. where the trinucleotide repeat will be longer. The longer your repeat sequence is, the more likely you are to present with earlier symptoms or more severe symptoms of okay. the disease. You know, it, before the new nomenclature, this disease was called Huntington's chorea, and that implied the chorea form motion disorder, but the, cogn the cognitive disorder is just as bad, if not worse, right? Yes, and can be quite dysfunctional in terms of affecting the quality of life of the patient, so it's very important to appreciate about the disorder and also manage as best possible as well. All right, well, how common is this? What's the prevalence of this disease? Anywhere between five to 10 per 100,000 persons. Okay, it's not a lot, but if you've got it, the incidence is 100%, right? And so how many, how, there, there's two classes of patients, those that are undiagnosed and then those that are misdiagnosed. Do we have any data on this? How does that break down? That's really challenging. Well, that's why I asked I, you. <laughs> Yeah, I think we tend, um, as payers, we tend to understand perhaps those that have been diagnosed, that have a higher level of severity. Perhaps they're already on treatment, um, including tetrabenazine. Uh, but otherwise, we may not even know these patients exist in the community. They may be misdiagnosed. They may be classified with other uh, conditions. Um, but perhaps until they get to a specialist and have been diagnosed, but they're but this is a, through the system. This is a big time disease. I mean, if you've got it, the symptoms are not subtle, are they? I mean, how would you misdiagnose this? Well, I think if the primary uh, symptoms are psychiatric and cognitive, it may be more challenging for a clinician to think of a neurologic cause for it, and they may be managed more in a psychiatric realm. Um, I think once the movements come in, most people realize that there's something associated with that and might get um, onto the right track in terms of the workup, but it can take time to get to that point for patients.